Good morning and welcome to another RF Crypto video. On today's market, it is down again. It's uh, down by almost 2.3% and the global crypto market cap stands at 1.64 trillion. The whole market has basically gone down by quite a bit. There are some exceptions. Cardano went up by 1.55%. But I mean, in general, the markets are down and we'll be speaking about why it's down in a few seconds. But before that, I want to just take a look at the Bitcoin chart. As you can see here, the previous support level of 40,000 was broken and a couple of videos ago, well by a couple I mean about 15 to 20 videos ago, I had mentioned that if the Bitcoin price falls below this $40,000 level, even just by a little bit, then the price will continue to tumble down to about 34 to 36,000. As you can see here, it was trading and tempting this support level. And once it went below that, the price just dropped to between 34 and 36,000. A couple of days ago, the support level dropped to about 34,500 and then the price rallied a little bit to 39,000 prior to the Federal Reserve meeting. But after the meeting, the prices went down and now it's trading at a margin of 35,685. And we can consider about 35,500 as the new support level. I see it trading between these 35,500 and 40,000 between the next few days. But I'm not very confident that it will reach 40,000, so it will trade closer to the $35,000 mark. So it's just important to keep an eye on the support level. If it goes below the support level, as it happened here, one red candle on the support level is followed by subsequent two or three more red candles, which push the price way down. And this could happen again, or it could break through this uh, resistance level and go all the way up to 46,000. But at this point, the markets are quite cold, they're quite bearish. So I see the probability of it going below 35,000 more than the probability of it going above uh, $40,000. So new support level, 35,500, new resistance level, 40,000. And these two bands are very important going forward. Moving on to the reason why Bitcoin rose from 35 to 40,000 and then dropped back down to 36,000. This is mainly because of the U.S. Central Bank's statement. So the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank says that they weren't going to increase interest rates in yesterday's meeting. However, he won't rule out an interest rate hike at a future meeting and signal that the central bank would steadily remove support for the economy in order to fight high inflation. I mean, it was believed that this all was already priced into the market and the prices wouldn't move so much after yesterday's meeting but that wasn't the case this is because after hearing fed chair powell talk so jerome powell the uh, federal reserve bank boss it became clear that the risk of more rate hikes was elevated the fed may raise rates at every other meeting with the balance sheet runoff starting in may or june so the balance sheet runoff means that the federal reserve is going to start decreasing the amount of money they pump into the market or they're going to decrease the size of their balance sheets, mainly because they want to fight the high inflation rate that is plaguing the American markets at the moment. And when it became clear that the rate hikes are going to come in the future, people, you know, people are behavioral, even though it, it was priced in, people thought, damn, this is real, this is really going to happen. And they started selling off Bitcoin because it didn't happen now. It's going to happen in March. So the price of Bitcoin was 35 to 36,000 after uh, it was clear that the uh, rate hikes were going to take place. This is before the meeting. Going into the meeting, the prices rose to 39,000. This rise from 36 to 39,000 was quite artificial. So from 39 to 36 was quite a correction because it brought everyone back to reality that no, rate hikes are really going to happen. So this 39,000 is overbought. So people started to sell it and the prices went down to 36,000 or 35,500. Um, and that's where the prices were before when the market started pricing in future rate hikes. And I mean, there are going to be more rate hikes coming forward. Uh, it is expected that they're going to increase it by 25 or 50 basis points. That's uh, 0.25 or 0.5 percent every quarter. Or they're going to keep doing this until the interest rates uh, reach 2 percent, which is their aim. So Coinbase is close to listing Solana ecosystem tokens. Uh, the exchanges stated mission of listing every allowable token is taking a first major step forward with plans to list Solana's answer to ERC-20. So Coinbase, which is a US-based crypto exchange, plans to allow withdrawals of SPL, which is Solana program library tokens, Solana's answer to Ethereum's ERC-20. So Ethereum has ERC-20 and Solana now has SPL. 
One person added that Solana Nates of USDC, which is Solana's stablecoin, with its $4.8 billion in circulating supply, would be among the supported assets, which, be, which would be huge because if USDC is accepted in Coinbase, people won't be stuck using USDT and they'll have more options in terms of what stablecoins they'll want to use. Listing SPL tokens would appear to mark a major development in Coinbase's token onboarding strategy. Up to now, it has only listed Ethereum-based coins and flagship layer 1 assets such as Algorand and Cosmos. So a little bit about ERC-20 and SPL for those who aren't familiar with it. ERC-20 is one of the most significant Ethereum tokens and has emerged as a technical standard. It is used for all smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain and it's used mainly for token implementation and what it does is that it provides a list of rules that all Ethereum based tokens must follow. The ERC20 commands obviously vital importance in the network. It defines a common list of rules that all Ethereum tokens must adhere to and some of these rules include how the tokens can be transferred, how transactions are approved, how users can access data about a token and also the to total supply of the tokens. Consequently, this particular token empowers developers of all types to accurately predict how new tokens will function with the larger Ethereum system. What this does is that it simplifies the task set forth for developers. They can proceed with their work knowing that each and every new project won't need to be redone every time a new token is released, as long as the token follows the rules. And also this compliance is necessary because it ensures the compatibility between different tokens in the Ethereum ecosystem. The ERC20 defines six different implementation coding functions for the benefit of other tokens within the Ethereum system. So these six different implementation coding functions are basically the rules that have to be followed by all tokens listed on the Ethereum ecosystem. These six basic coding functions are total supply, balance, allowance, transfer, approve, and transfer from. And these code functions are integral for user token implementation, specifically in determining the amount of token in circulation, storing and returning balances, making transfer and withdrawal requests, and granting approval. And all this together, the set of functions and signals ensure that the Ethereum tokens of different types will uniformly perform in any place within the Ethereum system. As such, nearly all of the digital wallets that support the Ether currency also support ERC-20 compliant tokens. So you might have seen in your wallets that they support ERC-20 or that you can create an ERC-20 wallet. All the tokens that are in the Ethereum ecosystem are compatible with that wallet. And they're interoperable, which is a very, very important narrative going into 2022. Interoperability is very important. The ability for one network to communicate with, the, with another is of, of vital importance. And SPL is trying to dethrone ERC-20 as the king of sort of smart contracts and also setting of rules. And this might prove successful given Ethereum's problems with scalability, with costs and the network congestion. And it's just a matter of time until we see Solana going up and eating Ethereum's uh, market share. On other news, a struggling South Korean museum is auctioning national treasures. So there are two DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. The National Treasure DAO and the Heritage DAO formed independently from each other when South Korean media reported on the financially struggling Gangsong Museum's auction earlier this month. They share a common goal. Uh, which is to prevent artifacts from ending up in a private collections where the public won't be able to see them. So what they're trying to prevent is wealthy individuals purchasing these artifacts and keeping it in their home, keeping it wherever they want in their storage place where it's not available for the public to see. Given that it's a national artifact, everyone should be able to see it. But if it ends up in the hands of private collectors, they can do whatever they want with it. They were inspired by Constitution DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization that wanted to purchase one of the 13 original copies of the US Constitution. They failed because a billionaire outbid them. But this Constitution DAO uh, initiative raised public awareness of the DAO by raising $40 million from thousands of hopeful investors. Post Constitution DAO, people are spinning up DAOs to crowdfund big ticket purchases from golf courses to film scripts to Blockbuster which is quite interesting because it is a community uh, initiative where people pool money together in order to own something. So let's say they want to buy the rights to use Mickey Mouse from Disney. They will pool together money. They will go to Disney, say we want the rights to use Mickey Mouse. They have the rights to use Mickey Mouse. That 
decentralized autonomous organization can create their own show or comics with Mickey Mouse. And the advantage of that is that the owners of the DAO tokens or the shareholders in the DAO will have a say in what type of content will be created. And that's very important because it's a decentralized uh, organization with no hierarchy. Everyone has an equal say and everyone has an input of what to do with their assets, which in this case is Disney's Mickey Mouse. And that's very interesting because no longer will the power lay with a couple of people at the top, but it will lay with everyone that forms part of that DAO. So an internal revenue service special agents, so IRS, uh, the US tax authority, he said that crypto is the future, but there are mountains of fraud. Fraud and manipulation is still rampant in the space. And th the special agent highlighted market manipulation in particular, pointing to high profile investors having the ability to sway asset prices with single tweets. He mainly spoke about the involvement of celebrities in the space, perhaps thinking of examples such as Kim Kardashian and Floyd Mayweather, who recently got into hot water over promoting an allegedly fraudulent token dubbed Ethereum Max. So the creators of these tokens, which are a lot of them are frauds, they cozy up to these rappers, to artists, to um, actors, you know, all these famous people, and they say, can you shill my token? I'll give you a lot of it, and this is going to be a success, and you'll be even richer. They don't really know what they're doing. They just do it, and it backfires simply because it's a fraud. Also, during the event, the special agent stated that the reason the division was actively training and educating its agents on crypto and NFT regulation was because that this space is the future and wasn't going anywhere. So even the IRS is saying that crypto isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay. The digital asset world is here to stay. But with so much fraud, the special agent is right. You need regulation in order to prevent the fraud, in order to prevent the money laundering, in order to prevent market manipulation in order to have a stable system where everyone is able to benefit from crypto assets and not only a couple of hundreds which can manipulate the entire market. And it is clear that there's a lot of illicit activities going on in the crypto universe because just in 2021, the IRS investigators seized $3.5 billion worth of cryptos and this accounted for 93% of all assets seized by the division at the time. And they still have 80 cases in the inventory which are still ongoing, which can lead to more crypto being seized. The importance of regulation at this point is clear. The crypto market needs some rules to prevent anarchy. And this is how the whole crypto, NFT, metaverse, gaming, and the blockchain industry in general is going to flourish. And with that, we come to the end of today's video. Thank you very much for watching. If you like the video, please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. And... Please share the video with your friends and family. I'll see you tomorrow for the next one. Cheers.